Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Stacy Berry. Dr. Berry was born and raised in the Bay Area. She received her biology degree at the University of California, San Diego, and completed medical school at St. Louis University. Dr. Berry completed her residency at University of California, Davis, and is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. This is going to be a discussion about weight management. We're not going to be talking about diets, okay? We're going to be talking about how to have a more healthy relationship with food and explore a little bit about the problem we're currently facing in this country and how we got there. So I call it Stopping the Madness. And I named it that because about three years ago I went on a diet and I had to figure out, I wanted to name my diet, I wanted to name it. And I thought Stopping the Madness because so much of what we do is just maddening, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm just going to go over a little bit about the history. So what's the problem? Well, unfortunately, obesity is the problem. And in less than my lifetime, for in the last 40 years, the obesity rates in this country have tripled. That correlates to a lot of money, okay? The comorbidities associated with that weight gain in the country has led to a quadrupling of diabetes that equals money. 75% of all, every dollar we spend in this country on healthcare is related to lifestyle related diseases. So it's important that we need to talk about this because we can change it. So I always say you need to know a couple things about yourself. You should know your BMI and that word means your body mass index. It's simply your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. And it's what us doctors use. We look at people's vital sign. We look at their BMI to know, are they at any increased risk for health-related uh, diseases? And so ideal, um, very few people in this country are in the healthy weight range. That would be up to a BMI of 29.99. Most people, like myself included, are overweight. My BMI is currently 27, okay? So I'm an ob overweight category. Um, and then obesity is anybody with a BMI of 30 or greater, which unfortunately is a large percentage of this country. Um, we also use a tool called waist circumference, okay? We know that having a big middle or being like an apple is more dangerous than being a pear. So that what we call visceral fat, that fat around our middle is what causes disease. So we use waist circumference and it is dependent on your gender and it's also dependent on your race. So Asians we know put a lot more fat in their gut. They don't have a lot of superficial fat, they don't have hippie fat or breast fat, but they have that really scary abdominal fat. So even you can look at their, um, their weight and it be in the normal range, but when I do surgery on them and I open up their bellies, they f they're frequently very fatty on the inside. And that's why the obesity rates are so high. I mean, the um, diabetes rates are so high with Asians. Um, so they actually don't get as much waist circumference for being healthy, so that five, five inches less for men. So a normal waist circumference for a man is 40, um, but for Asian men, we say 35. So what's the big deal? So if you're obese, you increase your risks of having diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, strokes, sleep apnea, several types of cancers, joint damage from wear and tear. Something that I see a lot in my practice is women with urinary incontinence related to obesity. 
meaning they leak urine when they laugh, sneeze, or cough, which is directly related to the pressure on their bladder from their abdominal, abdominal circumference. Gallbladder disease, fatty liver, and a big par part of my practice is, is treating women with infertility related to obesity. Very common in certain ethnic groups, subtle changes in weight result in a shutting down of the reproductive system for women and leads to infertility. In the 80s, only 22% of Americans were obese. As of 2014, we're almost at 40%. And that's pretty scary. And the largest, fastest growing segment of the population in BMI is the class three obesity patient who has a BMI greater than 40. And unfortunately, we're seeing this in younger and younger people all the time. And currently, 7.7% of American people have a BMI greater than 40. We call that class three, or you might have heard the term morbid obesity. So what, would, what could we change? If we could make everybody ideal weight with a proper diet, we could eliminate 90% of type 2 diabetes, 80% of heart disease, 70% of colon cancer, 70% of strokes, 50% of dementia, and 40% of breast and uterine cancers. So the breast and uterine cancers are things that we deal with in my practice quite a bit, and obesity is a huge risk factor, especially for uterine cancer. You'll, you very rarely will see a thin woman with uterine cancer unless she has a genetic predisposition to it. So it's related to her diet. So here's the trends. Um, moving forward, the very lowest segment of population predicted in 2030, which is just 13 years from now, the very smallest estimates for obesity rates will be above 40%. And you can tell it's geographically dependent. I mean, we all kind of know where the problem states are, right? Louisiana and um, Alabama and um, Mississippi are notorious for having the highest BMIs. Um, Colorado always has the lowest. California's in the second lowest tier and the, um, some of the states on the East Coast. And I know, I know my, my family lives in Iowa, and when I go to Iowa to visit my family, I feel so petite. I don't know if you've had that experience, but I'm overweight. My BMI is overweight, so I should not ever feel petite. But when I go to Iowa, it is shocking. So if you ever travel in the Midwest, you might have that experience as well. So I tell everybody they should know these numbers, and it's shocking to me how few people know these numbers, including my diabetic patients. So you should know your BMI. We talked about what that is. Your A1C, I always tell my patients that's like a snapshot of your blood sugars for the last three months. So the highs and the lows, they average them all out. You get a blood test that says what your A1C is. That is a test for diabetes. It's a screening test for diabetes. If you are a diabetic or you are a pre-diabetic, please know that number. It, it changes everything about your health care. You should know that number and your goals should be getting it lower, lower, and lower. Okay. So we talked a little bit about waist circumference. Um, you should know your waist circumference because remember that, that fat in the middle is what is so dangerous for our heart and stroke risks. And then the LDL is the bad cholesterol. So we want that to be as low as possible. You should know those numbers. But I can tell you, out of all the diabetics that I take care of, so few of them even know their last A1C, which shocks me. So know your numbers, have them memorized, and work on getting them lower. You should work with your, your doctors to be partners on getting those numbers improved. Know your family history. Are you at risk for premature heart disease? As a man in your family, a father, an uncle, a grandfather, did they have a heart attack before age 55? I do. I, ha I have that family history. That's important to know because I need to take all my numbers much lower than people without that family history. Is there type 2 diabetes in your family? A lot of us have that in our family. Well, you have to be very conscious of your numbers. So know that. And do you have a family history of hypertension? As we age, if our parents were hypertensive, <coughs> we most likely will become hypertensive as well. So how did we get from the American Gothic to the Wally humans? Have you guys ever seen the movie Wally? And I, I thought that movie was so prophetic when you see these people 
they're basically in scooters and they're so obese and they're attached to screens and soda pops. And I think about those, that image all the time when I'm at the grocery store and see somebody so obese that they have to use a motorized cart to get from A to B. And that is a reality that people today are getting so large they cannot even move their body to do basic household chores. And it's really sad. And how did we get there? Screens and sodas. So a little bit more on how we got here. I'm a firm believer that it's all related to sugar. Okay. Um, our earliest ancestors ate no refined sugar, obviously. They had sugar sources in the forms of tubers and fruits, but they had no refined sugars. And, and by the 18th century, the consumption of refined sugars went up to approximately five pounds a year. And we think about about a five pound bag of sugar, you can see, yeah, you know, have a little bit in your coffee, make a cake. Um, but by the 19th century, it went up to 35 pounds of sugar per year. Anybody have any idea how much sugar the average American consumes this year? Nope. Nope. More like it. We, can, we consume 156 pounds of sugar. That is almost a half a pound of sugar per day. And you think, that's not possible. But it's mainly in things that are well hidden in everything you eat. But you've all seen people like this, right? They can't move. And what does he have right there? A soda pop. So the single largest contributor to sugar consumption in our diet today is sugared beverages, OK? And they come in all forms. Sometimes you think they're healthy. Sometimes you think, well, I'm having a sports drink because I exercised. It's all sugar. It's all sugar. Sunny D. People think, well, that's a juice for my child. It is all sugar, 10% juice. Who would feed that to their child? Yoo-hoo, 40 grams of sugar per eight ounce serving. It's insanity. And I didn't put down um, another graphic that I wanted to show because I see people that I work with all the time doing this is coffee drinks. Coffee drinks. You go to Starbucks, you get a Frappuccino, right? 50 grams of carbohydrate. 50 grams, okay? So there's no difference between drinking that and having a Coca-Cola, okay? So think about our beverages. We should only be consuming water or maybe milk occasionally, which is a sugar source too, but only about seven grams per serving. So that's where our largest single contributor. And then we also eat 130 pounds of potatoes a year on average. And most of it comes in the form of fried potato products. And you think about it, a lot of people in this room probably weigh 130 pounds. That'd be you eating your entire weight of potatoes in once a year. And then we also eat 130 pounds of refined sugars in the forms of breads. And I want you to look at these pictures. People would think, well, that looks pretty darn healthy, doesn't it? That's a whole grain bread. Two slices of whole grain bread have one quarter cup of white sugar in them. That's what your body consumes. If you have a cup of rice, rice is also in this, it's basically like eating six teaspoons of refined sugar. So that's not even counting all these things that we know are like fragrantly sugared. So we're not talking about all these things. We're talking about these things that we think are healthy options. Because we've been taught that, right? We've been taught that whole grains are healthy. Yes, ma'am. Is brown rice also that much sugar? No, brown rice has a little more fiber and less carbohydrate, but it's still a very high carbohydrate food, OK? It has a little more protein, a little more fiber. It is a better option if you must consume a rice, but it's still considered a starch. So how did Americans get here? Well, we talked about how 
world exploration has increased refined sugar. And it all, and for Americans, it really started with the change in the family dynamic. You know, in the 40s, our moms and grandmas didn't, they, were, they left the home to work. They had to work during the war effort and just changing demographics. And so we had less in the way of family farms. We had less time to prepare meals. Um, oh no, that didn't get, I'm sorry, that got cut off. But it basically, bottom line is it's relied more on processed foods. And I was talking to my husband about this and we were talking about, we grew up in the early 70s and our favorite treat, our moms worked, you know, if, if she didn't have time to cook, TV dinner. Or if we were really lucky, go through the drive-thru. And it's no different today, right? People are not preparing their food. They don't, they've lost touch where their food has come from. And they're going for these convenient things that are quick and easy, but not always the healthiest. So that's kind of how we started. Then America got richer, right? After the world war, there was more money for conveniences to make our life less taxing. We labored less, meaning our grandmothers, when they had to wash clothes, that was a workout. Have you guys ever washed clothes from hand? That, you get sweaty, your heart rate goes up, you're working out. Now we go, we push a button, Two. And that's that. So we have less work in our work. We are moving less and we are luckily having more leisure time, but that leads to a more sedentary lifestyle. What's interesting is if you look back at the early humans who were hunters and gatherers, they actually moved their body very little. They did it in tiny spurts and they rested a lot. With modernization, people actually move more physically but did less work. So more sedentary um, and less physical labor. Um, you know, before you had a, a vacuum cleaner, what did you do? You went and you took out a rug and you put it outside and you beat the heck out of it. Well, that is a workout. That is a workout. Um, and then we drive everywhere. I feel so bad for my patients who are immigrating here from India and they're um, newly married and on their first year they gained 30 pounds moving here. And it's because they're not used to driving everywhere. First of all, they're exposed to many different foods that they didn't have at home, but they walk everywhere. Like if you live in, in most parts of India, you walk everywhere. Here, even if we're going one mile to the grocery store, we hop in a car and drive. It's a lot less movement. So, um, and then I can remember on the weekends when I was a kid, my dad would do two things. He'd wash the car and mow the lawn. Now we go through a car wash and we have a lawn service or no lawn. So we're just moving less in general. And then we started playing with these computers. And there are people in my practice who basically sit for 10 hours a day straight, except for using the restroom. We are attached to screens and we do not move our bodies. And now we can even work from home, so we're not even getting into the trouble of getting in our car or taking BART. We're just going into the office, walking the 10 feet over to the office and working there. Our bodies are moving so much less than we have ever moved before. It's no wonder why the, the, sta the cards are stacked against us. It's almost impossible not to be in this situation that we're in given the current climate. And then we don't even have to go to the grocery store. Safeway will come to us. Yeah. Those really, really obese people that have BMIs, you know, like 80, 60, 80 who are immobilized, you always think, well, how do they eat? It comes to them or they have somebody enabling them and purchasing the food because they cannot move. They're, they're bed bound. But they still maintain 10,000 calories a day by getting food delivered and or having people bring it to them. So everything has just led to less movement. Plus, our government has not helped us at all. They have led us through this fake nutrition science which was never evidence-based and still not. But this is what we were all raised with, right? The food pyramid. You were supposed to eat 12 servings of grains a day. 12 servings of grains. That was the start of heart healthy lifestyle, right? Because if you ate whole grains, you weren't gonna get heart disease. Now we know it's completely false. This is what, when my mom served me a plate at, for dinner every night, it kind of looked like this. 
There was a starch, there was meat, and a little bit of vegetable. And this one also has fruit. But this is not healthy. We should not be eating this much grain for dinner. Why? If we don't use it, we're going to store it. Grains are immediate fuel sources. Carbohydrates are immediate fuel sources. If you're not going to burn it, you're going to store it. And we store it in our butts, in our bellies, and in our arteries. Okay? So grains in the evening should be avoided. No bread, no rice, no potato, no pasta. Okay? Yeah, and so this is, um, and the government's also against us because they make these foods so cheap by subsidizing the farmers to grow or sometimes not even grow. And these subsidies are things that we should not be consuming. Has anybody looked at the labels of their favorite products over the last five, ten years? For some reason, they're sneaking in high fructose corn syrup and stuff that you've eaten every day. Ketchup. Kosher pickles. No, I've been eating these products my entire life. They had never had high fructose corn syrup. They were added between eight and 10 years ago, and they're going up higher and higher. Why? Because it's a cheap preservative. People are addicted to sugar, and these people that, um, it's a cheap way for the manufacturers to get a product that's basically free due to the government subsidies. Read your labels. Look at your favorite things that you've had your entire adult life, and you will be shocked to find the ingredient of high fructose corn syrup in almost everything. I have to go out of my way to find products for my children that don't contain it. You have to look for the pickle that doesn't have it. Who ever thought a pickle would have high fructose corn syrup? I actually wrote to, to Vlasic Pickles. I was so pissed. <laughs> I was like, what the? Well, that's all sugar, yeah. I mean, we, when we make pickles, if we make a bread and butter pickle at home, we add sugar to the brine. But we're talking a kosher dill should not have a sweetener in it. But that's just one of many things. HP steak sauce, do you guys know what HP steak sauce is? If it's made in Canada or in this country, it has high fructose corn syrup. If you buy the stuff from Britain, it has none. Look at the label. I actually get mine ordered on Amazon from Britain. I try to minimize all the sugar contents that you don't need that sugar. It's not giving you any additional pleasure or any additional taste. It's just making your arteries clogged and killing your liver. More things about the, the government has made it so complicated for us to read labels. You know, these things that are considered heart healthy. Um, I, I show a picture of a kind bar. Do you guys know what a kind bar is? They're fantastic. Yep, they're, um, they're a great treat. It's mainly fruit. They have um, five grams of carbohydrate and sugars in them per serving. If there's, they have several different bars, but they have a whole series that is just five grams or less. They had to sue the federal government to get a healthy label because according to the FDA labeling, they didn't have enough grain in their nut bar. So it has become, it's, it's all marketing and the FDA controls it all, basically. So you, it leads it to, up to us. We have to actually read what's in things instead of relying on those heart healthy labels that we're so used to seeing. And unfortunately, um, I think we've all gotten pretty good about reading nutri nutrition labels, right? So we look at that and the first thing we see is the calories. We don't see calories per serving. Sometimes the serving is usually about a third of what the average person would eat. Yeah, there's 2.5 servings, or like you'll get, um, you'll get some kind of beverage that'll say a sports drink or something, and it, it's this size, and it's 2.5 to 3.0 servings. Well, nobody divides a sports drink into thirds and just consumes a serving. They consume multiple. And so I think that having realistic serving sizes is important to stay educated. So always, the first thing I always look at when I see a nutrition label is I look to see how many servings should this serve. And it's very depressing, especially when you're looking at like Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And you realize a serving is one half 
cup. One half cup is that much. Well, I don't know many people who eat that much ice cream. <laughs> so read serving sizes. And then the advertising. I mean, I'm older than the average new mom, but um, I can remember being bombarded with formula advertising. I mean, it starts you know, before they're even born, pushing people to buy synthetic proteins that are in formula, which predispose us to many health problems as we age. And then the sugared cereal. When I look at sugared cereal, I think, that is dessert. Why, why would somebody start their day with a sugared cereal? When I was a kid, we had a couple options. We had shredded wheat and we had plain Cheerios. And, um, and I was raised that way. And then I went to college and there were like 40 different options of cereal in the cafeteria. I gained 40 pounds in five minutes flat. They talk about the freshman 15, I gained the freshman 40. And it's because I'd never been exposed to those type of things. I'd had cereals. I said, well, why can't I have cereal still? Just switching to those high sugared cereals. And maybe the beer had something to do with it too, but you never know. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then soda, soda, soda. It, it's, it, it just shocks me. Sporting events for our children. The sponsor, they have vending machines with soda. I mean, your children should never be consuming soda. If you do, it is a special treat like a dessert. And you would never get a dessert and a soda because it's the same thing. It is basically a pile of sugar. And you could, if you, there are lots of graphics we'll show you exactly how many teaspoons of sugar are an average soda. It'll disgust you. And so if my kids ever get a soda, and you know what I hate the most is when you go to a restaurant with your children and you let them have a soda and they finish it and before you turn around they refill it without even asking you. It's just poison. It really is. I, I can't say enough about it. It's even the diet stuff. We're learning more and more about kidney disease and uh, premature Alzheimer's. Water should be your beverage of choice. And then we've got the American portion sizes, right? We've all seen the shows. When you, go, when you travel in other parts of the world and you order a meal, Americans are always shocked because our serving sizes are off the hook, which has led to this addiction and our taste buds have been completely desensitized to sugar. Two years ago, I went off sugar completely. And I remember about two weeks into the program, I had a glass of milk and I kept thinking somebody slipped me a milkshake because I had upregulated my sweet sensors again. It's just like, have you ever been on a low salt diet? If you go on a low salt diet and then somebody hands you a regular salted thing, you're thinking, oh my God, it's so salty. Well, the same thing has happened with all of our taste buds regarding sweet. Sweet is the first and most prominent sense in our mouth. That's why babies live is that they're, the breast milk is so sweet. It keeps us alive. So that sweet receptors are very, very powerful but they can get overloaded and you become completely desensitized. After a little bit longer on my low sugar, no sugar diet, I can remember I had a tangerine and I almost fell over. It was so intensely sweet. And I, you know, I wouldn't have been aware of that just a few months prior. So you can upregulate your taste buds and you can taste the natural sweetness in vegetables and fruit and it's really quite remarkable. And, uh, we all eat like robots. We don't sit down and look at the meal and appreciate who prepared it. We sit, we look at our cell phones, we look at our iPads, we have the television on, and we mindlessly eat. You know when you go to the movies and you get a thing of popcorn and you're sitting there and you're just like shoveling it in, right? You're not even thinking. You're not thinking of how it tastes on your mouth. You're not thinking about your digestion. And you know, the credit, the opening previews are over and you're, wait, I haven't started the movie yet and I've already eaten this whole tub of popcorn. Well, we're doing that every day with screens and we really need to cut it off. We need to turn off every screen and actually have a proper meal. And then a lot of us are guilty of this. We eat for all kinds of reasons, right? We fill voids and we medicate emotions. Ask yourself, why am I eating? For me, it's usually boredom. I get bored. I have to constantly be entertained. 
I find myself getting food if I'm bored. That's ridiculous. You shouldn't be getting food when you're bored. You should be getting food when you're hungry. Not when you're feeling depressed or happy or celebrating. You should get food when you're hungry and you should eat until you are no longer hungry, not eat until you're full. The reward. I hate to diss my mother so much, she's not here, but I was um, very much raised in a clean plate award environment. So every night we'd have a starch, we'd have a protein, and we'd have a vegetable, and Stacy, you had to sit at the table and complete it all if you, got, if you wanted a reward. I wasn't necessarily hungry for all that food, and those weren't necessarily the right things to do. But I was told that if I was a good girl, I'd finish my plate, and then I'd get a special treat. Even though I wasn't hungry to finish the meal, I would encourage you to not raise your children and grandchildren with that mentality. It is so dangerous. And it led to me for a lifetime of problems because I work really hard. I work long hours. I frequently feel like I deserve a reward. So what do I do after being up all night delivering babies? I go to the doctor's lounge. You know what's there? Donuts. You'd think that we'd have healthy things for doctors. We don't. We have bagels and donuts. So I've been up all night. I deserve a reward. Breaking that cycle of thinking I need to be rewarded with food has been very, it's been the hardest thing in my journey. And it's been a journey. But um, the other thing is food doesn't equal love. My, my mother, my poor mother, she's getting old. She's really a wonderful woman, but um, she, comes to visit my children and she brings two things almost every time. She brings uh, dad's root beer and vanilla ice cream because Grammy makes root beer floats with the grandchildren. And so she has equated that treat with love, grandparents' love. And it's taken me 10 years to get her to stop doing it. I keep saying they want you to be with them. They don't need this is poison. Stop that association. Food does not equal love. Love equals love. Okay? That's a tough one. I, I struggle with that too. So if you've decided that there's a problem, let's get started. Let's try to figure, we figured out how we got here. Now we need to know how to figure, I'm gonna give you some tools, okay? Everybody has to start admitting that they have a problem, and we all do. So know your numbers, the numbers we talked about, your A1C, your BMI. And whenever we get ready for a big change in life, we have to prepare our mind and our body and our environment for the change. So I work a lot with, luckily not so much anymore, but smoking cessation with my patients. And um, I equate it to that. When I have somebody who's gonna quit smoking, they wanna quit smoking and said, well, you have to prepare. You have to get rid of every trigger in your environment. First of all, of course you get rid of the ashtrays and you get rid of the cigarettes, but also get your drapes professionally washed. Get your windows scrubbed because there's so much nicotine in your house. Get your leather jacket cleaned. All those little smells will be a trigger for you. So you have to prepare your body and, um, and prepare your environment. And you have to tell people. You gotta tell people, I'm gonna be making some changes and I would love your support and shout it to the world. Get on social media. Get on Facebook. Hey, I'm joining a program. I'm going to be posting my results. The kudos you will get is very powerful. It's been a proven technique. Get on, admit there's a problem. Hey, I'm trying to drop 10 pounds. Anybody want to follow my journey with me? Announce it. Announce it. So when we're preparing our home for diets, we have to get rid of temptation, right? So we want to go through the pantry. We want to go through the freezer. And you know what? It's okay to throw the crap away. Donate it to a food bank if it's in good condition and not opened, but if it's partially used, throw it out. And a lot of my patients say, well, I like to have a special treat for the grandkids when they come up. I like to have some cookies. I like to have a couple cans of soda. Your grandkids don't need that poison. Get rid of it. If you're gonna make some changes, you cannot be tempted. You cannot. It just doesn't work that way. So you're gonna purge everything and get it nice and tidy. Do you guys use a kitchen scale? Do any of you have them? Kitchen scale is the most important thing that you can have if you're going to make changes. 
you need to know how much you're consuming. That's the only way you're gonna make changes. I put the measuring cups on this uh, graphic too because we all have cereal bowls at home or ice cream bowls. Well, they really are for four to six servings. So if you're going to measure three, so cereal a serving is three quarter cup. So you know what a good cup measure is, right? So you get three quarters of that. Who eats one ser serving of cereal? Nobody. So if you're gonna make some changes, you need to have a scale, you need to have measuring cups, and they need to be where you see them. And every time you consume something, you should know how much you're consuming, if you're gonna be perfectly honest with yourself. So um, single serving food containers. Get rid of all your plastic stuff with nasty chemicals. I recommend getting glass only. And all these little ones that are just single serving. Because if you do a meal and you break it down into single servings and you reach into the refrigerator, you don't have to do any guesswork. You've already done it. It makes life so much easier. And um, I say downsize your utensils and plates. I know it looks silly to have a baby plate there and baby spoons, but that's an old Weight Watchers tip. You use a bread plate or a salad plate instead of a dinner plate. You use a teaspoon or a salad fork instead of a regular dinner fork. I know it's all psychology, but it works because a lot of us like to see a full plate, you know? So have a smaller plate. These are simple little tools. If, if each one of you could take four things away from this lecture, little, little tiny things that you may not even have thought about you'll make really good positive changes over time. That's what it's about. Everybody needs to have a scale. A digital scale. Why? Because we can't see those little numbers down there. And is it, am I leaning this way? Or am I leaning this way? You know, the old ones, they can vary by five to eight pounds depending on where you're sitting on it. A digital scale will not lie. Make sure your batteries are fresh and store it in a place that's gonna be consistent. Don't move it around a lot because that'll change the accuracy. Everybody should weigh once a week, okay? A lot of people who are um, trying to reduce wanna weigh much more frequently than that and that is not a good idea. Record it, write it down. You, there's apps for that. There's, um, you, can have, you can print out sheets. You're gonna weigh once a week and you're gonna chart trends. Okay, are we going up or are we going down? What's the trend? And then we're gonna share that information on social media or with a friend or somebody else who's going to be on this journey with you. It's always so much easier when you have a buddy um, that you can share this information. But don't weigh more than once a week because um, there's too much variation in our metabolism, um, salt, uh, fluid shifting, all kinds of things, especially if you're still menstruating, there's lots of hormonal shifts that go on. Pick one day per week that you can be in a consistent environment. I always say Saturday morning, after you go potty, totally buck naked, same situation, same time. So that number is gonna be a consistent data point. So it's better to wait before eating Always before eating or even drinking water. So setting goals. I recognize a lot of faces in here. A lot of you are my patients. And when we talk about diet and nutrition, I always say, so what's your goal? And they always say, well, I'd like to be exactly what I weighed when I graduated from high school. And we always go, okay, that would be nice, but let's think about that. When we were in high school, we probably weren't having good nutrition. I know that I lived off of Snickers bars and Diet Coke and um, Cheetos. I was super, super skinny, but I wasn't fit, okay? So set a reasonable goal. There's some interesting studies looking at people's weight loss programs where they take thousands of people and ask them what their goal is, what their happy weight is, what their ideal body weight is, and almost invariably not a single person in these thousand patient studies ever makes that goal. But they're all pretty happy with their weight loss. So that number that you have in your head, you know, my fighting weight was 160, it's not reasonable for a mature person and not necessarily even healthy. You know, as we get older, um, it doesn't take much for us to really tip over and to be unhealthy. So if you're super thin and you get influenza, which is very common, it can lead to death. 
if you don't have enough reserves, you all know people like that who are so thin and any little thing just tips them over. So we want you to find a goal that is attainable and sustainable. Okay, you wanna find a goal which gives you healthier parameters. And then identify whatever challenges that are coming up in your life. I know when I started my uh, low sugar diet two years ago, one week after I started um, the program, my husband and I had planned a vacation. Well, that didn't, you know, but I was, I knew that was gonna be a challenge and I worked around those challenges. Um, there's always celebrations, especially when you have children, you know, there's always a birthday party, there's always the holidays. You need to think about how you're gonna approach those days moving forward. Is it the holiday season? Are we gonna have celebrations for a season? Or are we gonna have a special meal on that one day? Okay, because I know the holiday season tends to morph into, for me, about 15 pounds if I, if I don't watch it. And, but it's okay to have a special day or just a special meal. You know, Thanksgiving is a, is a special meal. That doesn't mean the breakfast is special. That doesn't mean after dinner snack is special. It's the meal itself, that one meal. It's not the whole day. So what's considered effective changes? It's not as much as you think. Making small changes will impact your life dramatically. Um, what we consider a very effective weight loss in, in managing women's health and men's health too is one pound a week. Okay, that's our goal for effective weight loss. And as little as a 5% reduction, so if you're a 200 pound person, that would be 10 pound weight loss in three to six months. We know that those people are making effective changes that will be lifelong. Excellent responses to therapy, including medication and surgery, is when we lose 15% of our, our, um, our body mass. So if you're 200 pounds, that would be a 30 pound weight loss in three to six months. That would be an excellent response and very quite rare to get those numbers. Um, but we know, I always tell my patients who have suffered with problems related to their weight, if you can lose at least five to 10% of your body weight, especially in my profession, um, urinary incontinence drops almost to zero and uh, people's fertility returns, meaning their menstrual cycles return and they're able to conceive. Um, and that is, it's so fascinating to watch and, and they're shocked, but it doesn't take a lot of changes. We see changes in blood pressure, A1C, we see people getting off medications with just small changes in their BMI, as little as 10%. So when to ask for help. Um, you guys are, don't have to do it alone. You know, everything's stacked against you between the media and the screens and additives to food. Sometimes we need to ask for help. And so if you have a BMI greater than 30, and you have no other medical problems, meaning you have no blood pressure issues, no diabetes, you are eligible for weight loss medications that your doctor would prescribe. If you're just overweight, like I'm overweight, you know, your BMI of 27, and you have a comorbidity, such as type 2 diabetes or hypertension, it's okay to ask for help in that situation too, with uh, prescription medications. There's no free lunch with medications. They all have side effects. Some are habit forming and are, lead to addiction. The safest drug out there is actually this one depicted in this image here, uh, Zenical. Do you guys know that one? It's actually available over the count counter as well. It's a fat blocker. It's a fat blocking agent and it's recommended for people anywhere from three months to four years. It has a completely safe profile, but it has side effects. So Zenical is a fat blocker. So it, whatever fat you absorb, 30% is eliminated in your stool. So you're consuming less calories and less fat, but what do you end up with? Fatty stools, fecal incontinence, flatulence. So that's the main side effect associated with that. But you know, it is, has a, the best safety profile of any medication, and it's probably underutilized. I underutilize it in my practice. I, I used to prescribe it quite a bit about 15 years ago, but I had so many patients who had unpleasant GI side effects that they discontinued it. Um, so the, the most commonly prescribed weight loss medication in this country is called Phentermine. It's an amphetamine, okay? It's just like mother's little helper back in the 60s. It's the same thing as um, crystal meth. It's just a different variation of it. 
it is an appetite suppressant, okay, and it is habit forming. Um, it is associated with side effects such as dry mouth, hyper, um, high blood pressure, headaches, constipation, insomnia. Um, but if under the care of a physician and for short term use only, it is mildly effective. So when we compare people on and off medications, the people in the medications groups do a little bit better at the six month mark. Not significant, not a huge amount better, but they do a little bit better. So fentramine is the most common. There's a whole host of brand new medications on the market um, that are combination drugs, usually using um, anti-seizure medications and antidepressants. And you'll probably have seen lots of ads for type 2 diabetes medications where it says may promote weight loss. So those are Liptons. Um, and those are associated with weight loss. We use those for people who have type 2 diabetes and also need to weight, lose weight. You might have heard of metformin, which is a very common medication used for prediabetes and diabetes. It is associated with a mild weight loss in some people as well. So there are lots of medications. There's no free lunch. They all have side effects. Who needs more help? So if you have a comorbidity, as we've defined before, like high blood pressure or diabetes, and your BMI is greater than 35, the evidence is very clear, you should consider weight loss surgery. If your BMI is greater than 40, irregardless to whether or not you have any comorbidities, weight loss surgery is highly recommended and will prolong your life. The data is clear, okay? You will live longer um, if you survive the surgery. <laughs> so the surgery does have morbidity associated with it, yes. Yes, ma'am. I am not a bariatric surgeon, and I think that they look at everybody independently, but you know, you have to be a surgical candidate. Some people are better candidates than others. And there's not a single bariatric program, that's what they call this type of surgery, bariatric surgery. There's not a single bariatric uh, program that would just say, oh yeah, your BMI is 40, we're gonna go to surgery next week. No, you have to prove to them that you, uh, usually it can be up to a year of psychological treatment, nutritional education, Prior, and they usually expect about a 10% weight loss on your own prior to having surgery. But they're remarkable sur surgeries. There's three depicted here. The first, the first image is the bypass. So they're basically bypassing the stomach. So you're hooking up your duodenum. And so you lose that capacity of the pouch of the stomach, which leads to metabolic changes and all good stuff. All good stuff with the blood pressure, the blood sugars, the lipids, all of it improves. This is called a sleeve, um, where they just make the stomach much smaller. So they typically remove about 70% of the entire stomach, so you have less room to shove it in. We think where we eat. I mean, how many of us eat on the go? We eat in the car, we eat on the counter, we eat at our desk. If we don't sit down, take time to think about what we're doing, what we're consuming and the nutrients we're absorbing, it's going to lead to overconsumption. You're not going to be able to recognize those triggers, hey, I'm full, you know? Um, again, the mindless eating thing with the, whoopsie, the mindless eating thing with the uh, ham, I mean, we're all guilty of this, right? Sit in front of the tube, shoveling it in, not thinking about how the food even tastes. We're not listening to how our body feels when we consume the food, because we're distracted. And cook your own food. <laughs> when you cook your own food, you get to control everything about the food. The source of the food, are you buying organic? Are you buying um, fresh things? Are you buying canned things? Are you buying frozen things? You get to be in charge. If you go to a restaurant, you get no say over that. You get no say in how much salt or oil is added to the food. You should be in control. And I have lots of patients who say, well, Dr. Barry, I don't know how to cook. It's never too late to learn. Take a class. Fremont Rec has great classes. Learn some simple things. Learn some go-to things. I mean, I have teenage children. We have them learn to prepare 10 meals every summer. And um, so by the time they leave for college, and my oldest is getting ready to leave for college this summer, they have a repertoire of over 100 recipes they know how to make. Um, not only will that help their nutrition, but it'll save a lot of money too. So that's something that we've taught our children. 
you know, by the time they were old enough to reach the stove, they knew how to make scrambled eggs. I mean, everybody can make scrambled eggs, right? And that's probably one of the best things you can eat. Um, any program that you start, the hallmark of it is food journaling. Simple rule. It passes the pie hole, you write it down. That means even if you're babysitting your grandson and he has a leftover cheese it and you put that in your mouth, you have to write that down. What's that going to do? It's going to make you stop and think, do I really need that? Do I want that? Does that even taste good? Will that make me want more? Usually yes, right? So write it down. If it's worth it, it's worth writing down. If it's not worth writing down, then don't eat it. Don't eat it. Write it down. And that's where that kitchen scale and the measuring cups, not only write down what you're eating, when you're eating, how much you're eating. And then you can also add another component to that. This is one that I really like, is a little biorhythm. Ask yourself, how do I feel after I ate that? Why did I eat it? Was I hungry? Do I feel satisfied? Do I feel full? You know, we should never eat to the point where I'm stuffed. Because that is just not what the point is, right? We should be eating until we're no longer hungry. So write it down. So this little bit about that. Ask why you're eating. Are you eating out of boredom? That's usually me. High functioning people need to be constantly stimulated, and that's me. And sometimes the only thing that stimulates me is having food when I'm not hungry at all. Um, and then ask why you stopped eating. Did you stop eating because the plate was empty? Did you stop eating because you really could not fit another bite in? Neither of those are necessarily healthy. You should stop eating when you're no longer hungry. And if you're no longer hungry, your satiety center will kick in. We have to get in tune with that satiety center. That means, are we satisfied? We need to get back in touch with that. Are we no longer hungry? So few people eat, stop eating when they're no longer hungry. Most people stop when the food's gone or they're full. Avoiding triggers. You guys know what hangry means? So it's most little boys and a lot of adult men that I know get hangry. When they get hungry, they don't necessarily verbalize that they're hungry. They just get nasty. They get ornery. They get snippy. You know, avoid being hangry. And I see this all the time with my patients who uh, they all say the same thing. I rush out of the house and I don't have breakfast and I'm going, 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 and then boom, hit a wall, and they just consume food until there's no tomorrow. Because they didn't break the fast. They didn't have their breakfast to break the fast. What happens when we break our fast? We stop the cortisol levels in our body from rising, okay? We need to give ourselves nourishment after eight to 10 hours. Our liver can't keep up with that. If we don't break the fast and have the breakfast, we're going to end up in this situation, which leads to very poor food choices. Have, lo have lots of options available to you. Satisfy your brain and your body with snacks throughout the day. Eat several times a day to avoid the situation, because that leads to very poor food choices. Develop strategies for socializing, eating out, and celebrations. Um, this is something that I started doing. You know, occasionally, you know, even when you're dieting, you're meeting friends for dinner, right? whatever, and you're going to go to a restaurant. You don't have control over the food you're eating. You get to make choices in the menu that are better for you than um, others. But I always bring a Tupperware container with me. And as soon as the food is served, I take half the portion and put it directly in the Tupperware, put it in my purse, and I eat half the portion. Because I can guarantee you every restaurant that I've ever been to serves you way too much food. And if it's on the plate and you're chatting with friends, you're going to eat it. Just get in the habit. Now, if you're really hungry, if you still are not satisfied at the end of that, then you can reach into your Tupperware and grab a little bit more. But I bet you'll find you won't be hungry. And you take that second portion home and you have it the next day. It's an easy tip. Um, I, I got into a real bad habit over the last 10 years of hanging out with a group of friends. Uh, we all had young children together, and we would have uh, several parties a week, and it always involved eating and drinking and not thinking about what we were consuming. 
And so creating new activities that are not food centric has been really hard. But so instead of let's play, instead of playing cards on Saturday night, which we would normally do or play some other game, let's take a hike in the morning. Let's change it up. Something that's not related to food because as soon as we have a card game, well, what are you bringing? What are you bringing? And chips and mindless stuff that you just you're chatting and you're not even thinking. So Creating new non-food centric activities with friends and family is really critical, especially with children. Because I mean, I'm just as guilty as everybody. Let's go, you know, to the zoo and get an ice cream. You know, why does it have to have that? Why don't we have a healthy meal before we go and go enjoy the animals? So, and then redefine the cheat day. A cheat day, we all get them, right? But it doesn't need to be a day. It can be a portion of a meal, right? Your cheat. I'm going to have a cheat day. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll put some sugar in my coffee that morning or redefine it. It's not a whole day of splurges. It should be one special, you know, you're going to be hanging out with friends. You're going to go meet for happy hour. Yeah, you're going to have a couple cocktails, have an appetizer. That's your cheat for the day, not the whole day. So redefine that. We all have to go shopping and we're going to be cooking more. So we're going to do a lot more grocery shopping before you go eat a high protein snack. It'll save you a ton of money and you make better choices. So I always eat like a hard boiled egg or a string cheese on the way to the grocery store. Um, I, it gives me uh, less cravings, okay? And you, not, you won't be tempted by all that stuff that keeps bombarding you to buy me, buy me that's on sale. Plan your week before you go. So while you're, while you're having your, your high protein snack before you go shopping, plan your week. Okay, so Monday night, I know I gotta go to the PTA meeting, so I've gotta do, plan it, strategize, right? So you know the days that you're gonna be short for time, over committed, when you need to do takeout, plan your week. And if you have the option, prepare your meals ahead of time for the entire week. So. That is one of the best um, tips. The other great tip is, have you guys heard about this? Just avoid the middle. Every once in a while, I'll go into the middle, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much crap in here. So avoid the middle, the entire middle of the grocery store. Um, there's a few exceptions. I would say canned beans and certain frozen vegetables are fine. Those typically are in the middle. But everything else, you should avoid. You know, some of the condiments are in the middle. Just avoid it because you don't need to see that stuff because it's too tempting. So avoiding the middle. Um, now, just next time you go to Safeway, take a look at the stuff in the middle. It'll blow you away. It's just so much crap. Um, food composition. So as a general rule of thumb, if you are choosing between item A and item B, you want to choose the item that is the highest in protein, the lowest in carb, the highest in fiber, and moderate fats. So we're, that whole thing that they taught us in the 80s that a low fat diet was going to make you healthy, wrong. It caused diabetes and heart disease. Why? Because everything was substituted for sugars. Think of the Snackwell um, product line. Do you guys remember that? Snackwell? Couldn't have a cookie, but I could have a Snackwell. All sugar. What happens? Well, you feel like you're not getting the mouth feel, so you tend to eat a little bit more because you're not getting those fats that are so satisfying, and you're getting a huge sugar load. So that whole thing that we were taught when I was in medical school 20 plus years ago is bogus. We need moderate fats, but we need healthy fats. There's good fats and bad fats, but fat is important. It's an important fuel source. It also gives us the satiated feeling, the mouth feel. We want the avocado. We want the avocado oil. We want the salmon. We want those really healthy fats that will satisfy you and fill you up. So rethink breakfast. Uh, ditch the cereal. Get rid of it. Get Ditch the oatmeal. <sighs> if you're trying to reduce weight and you eat oatmeal, you're going to feel very satisfied for the first hour right because you've got all that fiber in your belly and your belly is going to feel full and then it's going to hit your pancreas and your blood sugar is going to spike not as high as it would with say apple jacks but it's going to spike and then it's going to dump and then you're going to be hungry again why don't you substitute that for some lean fish like salmon or eggs or 
um, even other meats or cheeses, and you will feel satisfied and not get those dips in your blood sugar, which have us snacking at inappropriate times. Ditch the cereal, ditch the bread. Rethink lunch. So when I bring my lunch to work, I actually bring it in two servings. I actually bring like six servings of food with me to lunch, to work. Um, but whatever I would normally consume at a lunch, if I just divide it into two, then I get a chance to really feel no longer hungry without feeling full. And I get an opportunity in a couple hours, if I do get hungry, to finish the other portion. And that way when I'm coming home from work, I'm not hangry, rushing into the house and shoving food into my mouth. That way I have more stable blood sugars. Okay, simple rule, if you just take one message away from today, nothing white after 5 p.m. Nothing white, except cauliflower. except for cauliflower. Nothing white, so no rice, no bread, no potato, okay, no pasta. You want a lean protein and a fibrous carbohydrate. What is a fibrous carbohydrate? Any vegetable, any green vegetable is a fibrous carbohydrate. So yeah, broccoli, asparagus, <laughs> Ha just yeah. ditch the white after 5 p.m. Remember, carbohydrates are an immediate fuel source. They're fuel that is released into our system, and if we don't use it, we store it. How do we store it? In our tushes, okay? We, we, we gain weight. So if you stop consuming carbohydrates at dinner. So this is how I spend my Sunday. I, I do this every Sunday. Um, I start my Sunday morning at the farmer's market, and I buy all my vegetables. And I, and I plan my breakfast, lunch, and dinner for every day. When I'm at work, I have it all in containers. And it looks just like this. Mine look very similar. Um, and so I don't have any guesswork. I open the fridge at 6.30 in the morning. I pull out container A, put it in my bag, I'm done. I don't have to be tempted by all the drug rep food, um, people or having to go grab something at lunch, it's done. I've thought about it, I've measured it, I've weighed it, it's done. It takes me two to three hours um, to do the whole week. That's not mine, that's uh, green beans, chicken, and... What's that on the left? I don't know, it's not mine, it's just a, just a Google image, but this is an example of how people meal prep, and this is a really big thing, you probably hear a lot about it in the media. And a lot of my patients say, Doc, I can't, I don't have time for that. I don't know how to cook and I don't have time for that. There's actually companies that do this for you. One of the anesthesiologists I work with has a company that does this for him and his daughter every week. And it's there um, because they don't know how to do it. So, but that is the key, you know, in between journaling and meal prep, that's 90% of the battle. Avoid eating out, but sometimes we have to. Like, you know, kids at baseball practice, whatever, you gotta grab something. Have two or three safety options. One of my safety options is um, Chipotle. I know exactly what to get there. Um, I know exactly how much to add of what. I, that's my safe choice. If I really can't get home with the kids after practice, we know we can stop there and I can have something that I won't be off plan on. Um, we also live in this area, there's two really great options. One is uh, Rayleigh's. Um, right here, and the other one is um, Whole Foods. They have a whole prepared food item, and you want to look for the words paleo or low carb. Those are going to be meals that you know are safe because they're not going to add a bunch of starches to it that will um, stop the ketosis process. So if you have to grab and go, which sometimes we have to grab and go, have two or three safety options available to you. And then I talked about bringing food containers when you go out to a restaurant and just put half of it away. And as, as we get older, we don't need all that food. And it, why not save the money, not be over full, and get two meals for the price of one. So we're gonna move more too. And this is little stuff. I mean, I'm not talking about learning to become a marathon runner. Um, rede redefine that primo parking spot, okay? I, it drives me crazy. I go to the gym several days a week and people circle at the gym looking for the spot near the door. You're going to exercise. Get your butt to the end of the aisle and walk to the gym. Um, so I like to choose a spot. I have a car that's only a year and a half old. I like to choose a spot where there's no one else around. I don't want anybody to ding it. So that's usually way, 
Um, and of course, we all know to take the stairs whenever possible. If you're a commuter and you take BART or any public transportation, do one thing. Get off a stop earlier or a stop later than you normally would. Walk that extra couple blocks. It doesn't take much, and that will add up over time. And then my biggest excuse that my patients always tell me is, I have an active job. I don't have time to exercise. Well, first of all, never tell that to a doctor, OK? <laughs> Sorry. The very least I work, the minimum work week is 48 hours, OK? Most of them are 60 to 100 hours. You can't tell somebody that you work too much to a doctor's face. You just can't. We work a long time. And a lot of them say, well, I, work so, I walk so much at work. You know, I'm, I'm very active at work. I'm up and down all day long. Two things to say to that. Number one, prove it to me. Get a fitness tracker. Tell me how many steps you're getting in. If you really think you're that busy, let me know. I can tell you, I, we start at our office. I get there a little bit after 7 and leave around 6 at night and see 30, 35 patients a day. Up, down, up, down. And then I walk Lake Elizabeth at lunch most days or go use an elliptical, I still don't have 10,000 steps. So if you get somebody who has a regular desk job and they're telling you they're stepping 10,000 steps, BS, yeah, not true. But we don't, we, that doesn't count as exercise. Active lifestyles is, is excellent and very helpful to the heart, but we need concentrated activity during our leisure time, okay? Time that we would normally be spend recreating in leisure, we need to substitute just 30 minutes of that per day, most days, so that's four days per week. Most means four or more. So if you say you have an active lifestyle, yay. But also just go and prove it to me by showing me your steps and showing me that you have 30 minutes of your leisure time devoted to physical activity. Um, here, I put some references here. Um, these things have been game changers for me. And I encourage you, if you guys have Netflix or any other streaming, most of these are available. These documentaries are total game changers. Um, if you watch Super Size Me, which I think came out over 15 years ago, um, I showed my children this uh, documentary when they were very young. My son had McDonald's for the very first time on a school band trip uh, about a year ago. Because he, of course, we've never exposed him to that. He was so repulsed. If you raise your kids understanding what's behind the marketing and the food additives that these corporations put in your food, it'll make you sick. And watch that, that documentary. It changes your view on fast food completely. And it, um, I can't say enough about it. Uh, King Corn is about the subsidies of the corn industry and the additives of uh, high fructose corn syrup to our entire uh, food food source, and it is a game changer. Food Incorporated it is more about um, corporate America and the processing of food. Um, this one I put in here called The Perfect Human Diet, it's all about what i just been explaining to you about how we should be eating and then how the food pyramid has gotten everything so wrong. It's really not well made. The production value is poor, but the every word is spot on and the science is there. And it's all from this young man's perspective who was eating the perfect American diet and had a heart attack at age 34 or 27, something. And so he spent his last 30 years researching what the humans should be consuming. Um, Wheat Belly is a book that is about these carbohydrates and how they interact with, our, with heart disease and, and diabetes. Uh, the Zone is, again, very similar. It's written by a man who's a physician who has a strong family history of heart disease, a premature death in his father and uncle, I believe. And he realized that the source of the heart disease was the sugars and not the fats. And um, so he's created, there's lots of products on the market called Zone products. They have the right ratio of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, but his book, if you like biochemistry stuff, it makes a lot of sense. And he has a good cookbook, too. Um, the South Beach Diet, same thing. Atkins, you guys have all heard of Atkins. And The Omnivore's Dilemma is a book about how we've gotten so removed from how we should grow food. You know, instead of family farms where we have lots of crops and animals, we have these large single crop farms and, and nutrient poor soils. And it's, it's a really interesting read. Uh, cookbooks to go to. Um, so when we talk a little bit about ketogenesis, that's fat burning. There's great cookbooks on getting into a ketogenic mode 
And uh, this one, the Wicked Good Ketogenics, is my new favorite. I've been really a bit enjoying it. And then I love to try new recipes. And Yumly is a, um, it's a website, and they have an app as well. What's nice is you can tailor any recipe to be whatever program you want. Do you want to be uh, paleo? Do you want to be ketogenic? So they'll ask you, you know, so then they'll give you, let's say you want to make um, a chicken dish. I don't know what I want to make. I'm, you, so you put in chicken and you know it, you want it to be low carb. You want it to be paleo. You put in all these parameters and then it gives you 20 different options. You know, so it's so fun to be able to play with that website. I use it pretty much every day and have made lots of good stuff. And then Calorie King um, is an app and a, and a web page that you can put, you're like, I don't know how many grams of fiber are in this. Whatever it is, you put it in. And it'll tell you exactly how many calories, what a serving size is, and how much fiber. Because remember, we're looking for high fiber, high protein, low carbohydrate foods. Okay, so those are just some resources that I use on a daily basis to help me achieve my goals. Um, and hopefully everybody's gotten at least four things they can take from this talk that maybe small changes, if you're not ready for a big change, just small changes that you'll hopefully live longer and live better.